Well, today I wanted to finally get around to doing a summary of my theory of everything, which is essentially quantum field theory, which I've been studying for the last 30 years. So everything is a result of quantum field theory. Surprise! Uh, it's based on Maxwell's equations and quantum mechanics with some improvements and enhancements. And to begin with, we can understand that dimensions, clock rates, permittivity, permeability, the speed of light, the fine structure constant, Planck's constant, the electric charge are all emergent properties of the quantum field. And all physical constants emerge from the quantum field. And that happens because quantum fluctuations have wavelengths and frequencies. And we know from the Casimir effect that there are electric charge dipoles which uh, behave due to Van der Waals forces. And so they also have Van der Waals torque, and this torque limits their motion, both linear and angular, the rate of rotation. And so that actually determines the wavelengths and frequencies. So the wavelengths and frequencies determine the dimensions and clock rates of the quantum field. They don't come from space. They're from the quantum field. And all the physical constants come from the quantum field because the torque determines the resistance to polarization and magnetization, which gives us permittivity and permeability. Permittivity and permeability give us the speed of light. And then the rate of polarization gives us the electric charge and the fine structure constant, and Planck's constant is the energy coefficient. So once you have all those, you have every other constant in physics. And so it's important to understand that there are no magical constants anywhere. They all come from the quantum field, as does everything else. But because dimensions and clock rates come from the quantum field, special and general relativity are quantum field effects. They have nothing to do with space-time, and there's no evidence that space-time is physical or ever was. It's just purely imaginary and always has been. And what that means is that when a body's moving relative to the quantum field rest frame, the Van der Waals torque increases, which slows clock rates and shortens wavelengths. While if you have a large body, like our sun, in the vicinity of it, you get an increased torque, which shortens wavelengths and shortens frequencies, slowing clock rates. And you get things like the Shapiro delay, which is an actual delay time delay due to the slowing of light, not because 96 kilometers of space disappear and then reappear after the sun passes by. And what that does is it makes general relativity essentially a form of optics. It's not a space-time geometry. And the thing is, we've known about this since Einstein. In 1911, Einstein tried to calculate the bending of light, but he left off the clock rate term, the frequency term, so he didn't quite get it right. So we missed the opportunity of having a unified quantum general relativity form back in 1911, because Einstein made a mistake. We could have had it unified back then. And some physicists know this, they've been studying it ever since, while the vast majority of physicists deny it. They don't want to have a unified quantum general relativity. They just ignore it and are vehemently opposed to it. Next, the strong force. The Casimir effect between protons and neutrons is the strong nuclear force. People know that the Casimir effect between two plates that pushes two plates together varies to the distance to the fourth power. And that means that at larger distance, larger than about a micron, it becomes so weak that it's not detectable. 
or not easily detectable. But the opposite part of the problem is when you get at very close distances, at some point it must be stronger than the Coulomb repulsion. And it turns out that distance is around 3 times 10 to the minus 15 femtometers. And at 0.5 times 10 to the minus 15 femtometers, it's about 100 times stronger than the Coulomb repulsion. And those values are equal to the strong force. It's a simple calculation that we can do of the Casimir effect between two spheres the size of the proton. And because the protons scatter at the charge radius, they have to scatter quantum fluctuations too, so they must participate in the Casimir effect. And next, with mass, it turns out mass is equal to the zero-point energy that particles displace, at least the proton, neutron, and electron. And this is an idea that Dirac came up with in 1930, that he thought perhaps the electron and positron have the same mass because they are pushing against the quantum field, his Dirac C, and they have to push equally because they're the same type of particle. Well, because they do scatter, as I said, the proton in particular, we are more familiar with the charge radius, there has to be some sort of structure and it has to displace the local zero point energy, the local quantum fluctuations, fluctuations that would have been there otherwise. When you calculate how much energy a proton displaces, it equals its mass. If you have a spherical shell approximation. And the neutron, of course, will be similar. And with the electron, you, the radius is based on the Compton wavelength. And of course, electrons do Compton scatter as well. Although its Compton radius experimentally has not been uh, verified to the same degree as the proton charge radius. So mass has nothing to do with the Higgs boson on Higgs field. And the mass of all the other particles is relativistic, and I'll go into that later. Then we have the weak interaction, such as beta decay. And those are due to quantum fluctuation interactions too. The problem with understanding beta decay is we don't have a mechanism for how beta decay is initiated, what triggers it, and we don't have a mechanism for what causes the energy distribution. Well, in order to get the energy distribution, it has to be interacting with something that has an energy distribution. And the only thing around is the quantum field. And so I came up with the idea if you have a neutron, and then you have a quantum electron positron, and say the positron annihilates with the electron component of the neutron, converting it to a proton, and then the electron becomes free. And by the way, if you look at the decay curve of energy, the peak of the curve, the mode, is at the point where the electron, quantum electron positron would have the pair production energy, which <laughs> it's intuitively obvious that that would be the case once you see it. And so all beta decay can be accounted for with variations of this type of quantum electron positron effect. And ultimately all weak interactions can be accounted for that way. And then we can talk about photons. Louis de Broglie, back in the 1930s, realized that in order to explain the polarization and the electric and magnetic field of photons, you needed an electric charge dipole, which he figured out must be a Dirac-type dipole, the electron-positron. Now, in principle, it could be any Dirac-fermion pair, even a proton, any proton. And so it would be a series of these quantum fluctuations. And a virtual photon would just be a single quantum fluctuation 
of an electron positron pair. And if we use this model, we get a much better understanding of photon interactions and the fields they cause. Then since you can't get electromagnetic acceleration from exchanging non-existent virtual photons, we have to come up with a new answer. And the particles and other objects, they don't have jetpacks. They don't expel energy in order to accelerate. They accelerate because they're being pushed. And when we look at the Faraday field lines, we see that the Faraday field lines of light charges are they're repelling each other. So we have an, a pressure pushing them outward. And with opposite charges, the pressure is reduced. So there's less pressure pushing them apart than pushing them together. This is very similar to the Casimir effect. In fact, the Casimir effect appears to be a model for how all forces really work. So if we assume, based on the evidence, that there is some quantum field pressure generated that obeys the inverse square law and is proportional to mass and doesn't heat objects and doesn't cause drag, then we have a mechanism for electromagnetic acceleration. And this is something that unfortunately has not been handled by the physics community previously. But we have to come up with an understanding of what this mechanism is. But the interesting thing is that once you have this electromagnetic acceleration, it meets all the criteria necessary for the Fatio-Lesage gravity effect to be true, where two bodies are pushed together because they shadow each other from the pressure of the quantum field. So in the pressure pushing on the outside of the body is not the same as the pressure pushing against the opposite body because there's a body in the way and hence the two bodies get pushed together. And this was an idea developed in the 1690s, contemporary with Newton, but has been disproven numerous times because people didn't study the electromagnetic acceleration. And electromagnetic acceleration can't be due to curved space, so once we have, and then once we have a form for electromagnetic acceleration, we have a form for gravity as well, and acceleration of non-electric bodies. Because the mass in electromagnetic equations and the inertial mass and the gravitational mass are all the same and mass can only be measured with respect to acceleration. So the acceleration has to be the same. And next we have inertia. Both Newton and Einstein were remiss in not solving the problem of inertia, or at least not trying to. Because with inertia, you have to also answer the question, why do non-electrically charged bodies have the speed of light limit? Because the speed of light limit is due to the permittivity and permeability of the quantum field. So the speed of light limit on neutral bodies also has to be related to the permittivity and permeability of the quantum field or an electrically neutral but equal version of those constants. So when we think of an electric charge moving and causing self-induction where the dipoles rotate and dipole rotation causes a charge to move, we have to have the same sort of inertia with non-electric bodies where a moving mass causes dipoles to rotate and dipole rotation causes the mass to move. And if we look for what sort of dipole could explain this, we can go back to Dirac's equation and see that his original solution for the antimatter is based on minus mc squared while matter is mc squared. So right there that shows that there's a polar relationship between matter and antimatter. And we also know 
that electrons don't fall into protons, that they repel each other. And a quantum electron positron pair and a quantum proton antiproton pair will always repel each other regardless of the orientation. And that, by the way, is how you get a Van der Waals like force that obeys the inverse square law. But if matter and antimatter are a dipole, then that leads to us having an inertial force that expands to a matter force that obeys a form of Maxwell's equations. Now this isn't new since Heaviside came up with the idea of gravita magnetics back in the 1890s. And many people have studied it since. But what's been missed is that it has nothing to do with gravity. It's inertia is the basis for gravito magnetics. And that explains things such as gyroscopic motion. And the matter force, in, in turn, explains the precession of the perihelion of mercury, dark matter, and dark energy. Danby and Van Flander have shown that if there is a tangential pseudo-force on the orbit of Mercury, you can get additional precession. Well, it turns out there's a real force that is essentially the Lorentz force. That if you have a, because of the rotation of the Sun and of the bodies in orbit, it develops a neutral matter field. And so as bodies move through it, you get a perpendicular force, which also explains the missing matter problem. Because then we have a condition where Newtonian gravity has three basic components. It has the Fatio Lesage inward pressure, it has the Lorentz force due to the tangential velocity, and it has the matter and matter being repelled from each other. And Newtonian gravity in the solar system is the net of all those things, which is why it's different in different parts of galaxies, or in different galaxies. And then different in between galaxies. Because in between galaxies, we don't have much of the Lorentz force. And which is a good thing, because if you take the estimated mass of the visible universe, the whole universe would be a black hole with a radius of 15.7 billion light years, which tells us that G is not constant. And because the Lorentz force isn't constant, that makes perfect sense. And then lastly, my big project was to try to see if I could model all of the particles using just electrons, positrons, protons, and antiprotons. And what I did was use the relativistic onium solution that was discovered first by Milne, rediscovered by Feynman and Sternglass, although only Sternglass published it. And then Brown had the simplest derivation published in Nature in 1966. And all this was ignored by the people that were enamored with quark theory, because it kind of ruins it. Because the relativistic positronium and electron and positron in orbit has the energy of a neutral pion, about 135 MeV. And if you have a proton antiproton, protonium, you get a resonance that has a mass energy of 125 GeV per C squared, the same as the Higgs boson. And it's possible using onium theory to build up in a model of all the unstable particles, all the mesons, all the baryons, and including the WZ Higgs and top as protonium type resonances. And I did that. I wrote a book about it. Goodbye Quark's the Onion Theory, and I did papers. You can see where I derived the mass of all the well-known 
unstable resonances, 500 plus, using this owning theory. And it shouldn't be a big surprise because the quark theory runs out of quarks. And so they end up using onium theory to complete it. They have charmonium and bottom onium resonances. But far more simply, relativistic positronium gives you pions and the muon. And then relativistic pionium gives you the kaons. And relativistic kaonium gives you the tau, the d meson, and the charm quark. And then relativistic donium, where you have two d mesons in orbit, orbit gives you the b mesons and the bottom quark and the charmonium resonances. And then if you have two b mesons in orbit, that gives you all the bottomonium resonance, the epsilon series. And if you put a non-relativistic proton in the center, you get all the baryons. And so it's a simple matter to construct a model that doesn't require any quarks at all. And I also skipped over that if you have a proton shell structure that gives you the mass and does the scattering, that structure also provides the charge, the spin, the angular momentum, and the magnetic moment. So basically the up and down quark don't provide any properties to the proton. So it's possible to come up with a far simpler model of particles that only uses electron positrons, protons and antiprotons. And their energy is additional energy above the rest mass energy of the basic particles and the neutron is relativist. So that gives us a model based entirely on quantum field theory where there's one force, the quantum field theory, there's one field, the quantum field, and two particles, the electron and positron. Although you could call it one particle if you like because they have the same structure that you just have two different polarities of the electric charge and matter and antimatter. But that's something people can debate. And that's my theory of everything or the basic outline of it. I've written books about it and papers and videos that I will link below in the description if you want to follow up on any of these ideas and learn more about them. So if you like the video, hit the like button and then share it with your physicist friends and subscribe to learn more about my research. And I have books for sale, like I said, with information and you can buy one of my books if you want to learn more about it or pull up some of my papers if you want to get, dig into the technical details. So thanks for watching.